The Christadelphians present This is Your Bible, a program dedicated to the study of your Bible to learn about the wonderful future that God has planned for this earth. Join us now as we open up the Bible and reason together around God's Word. Welcome back to another episode of This Is Your Bible. On behalf of the Christadelphians, I'm Mark Patterson, and we'd like to welcome you today. Today we'll be looking at our scriptures, and we'll be looking at a very special part of the scriptures. In your Bible, there are living parables. We've talked to you before about living parables, and today we would like to spend some time thinking about and sharing with you thoughts around the parable about the potter and the potter's house. We have with us today a special guest, Mr. Tyrone Smart. Tyrone is here with us from Queens, New York, and he's promised to share with us some very interesting thoughts about this parable of the potter and the potter's house. So please stay with us. We'll be right back. I don't know what your idea of paradise is. We all have our own views on the subject, but I think that most would agree the scenes we are looking at could be described as a touch of paradise. The Creator made this earth a paradise originally, and then mankind spoiled it by trying to do things his own self-centered way. Mankind has ever since tried to create his own paradise, one in which man is glorified and the Creator is forgotten. All around us we can see grim reminders of the remoteness of paradise, reminders that man without God cannot bridge that distance to the true paradise. In the Bible, in the book of Genesis, we're told that the original creation made by God was very good. We are also told that throughout the Bible that the world will be very good again when Jesus Christ returns to establish the kingdom of God on the earth. In Psalm 72 it says, He, Christ, shall deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also and him that has no helper. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence. In Isaiah 35, the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. And in the book of Revelation there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. Sounds good, doesn't it? This is what the Bible has to say about the good things to come. You can learn more about the message of the Bible and your part in God's plan by signing up for our free online Bible courses at thisisyourbible.com. Just click on the Learn More tab and register for Exploring the Bible. Yes, the Bible does tell us that there will be a true paradise here, again, on earth, soon. Will you be ready? Welcome back. Today we want to talk to you about the potter's house. We mentioned that our special guest today is Mr. Tyrone Smart. Tyrone, welcome to the program. Thank you. Now this subject of the potter's house, you and I have talked about just a little bit already, and it's very, very fascinating. It's very interesting. Tell me what it was about that subject that attracted you to it. I think the whole thing about the potter's house, I was attracted to it because I've looked at a lot of people over time that have been suffering through life. People who society sometimes give up hope on. They're considered less than nothing sometimes in the earth. And in looking at the work of the potter, to see that the potter has the ability to change where folks sometimes give up on you, has inspired me to do a little bit more research into this topic. Okay. So it's really about um, the, the overall concept here of the potter and the potter's house is really about hope for the, for the hopelessness. Yes. So let's, let's turn to our scriptures. I know that uh, there's several places where this concept is taught in the scriptures and, and we're told about it. So let's start in Jeremiah chapter 18. Yes. And there we can get an idea of um, what the potter is, what the potter's house is. You can share with us some of the critical thoughts there. Right. So in, in Jeremiah 18, we read in verse 2, um, the God speaking to Jeremiah, saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. 
So here we are, God speaking to Jeremiah, and this is literally going down to the potter's house. Yes, and that's interesting because when we think about God as the potter, the Hebrew word that is used is the word yastar. Okay. So God is the one who is designing the work. And Jeremiah is told to go down to the potter's house. It's like taking a step down. He has to mingle with the people, so to speak. All right. And if you've ever had the, the pleasure of looking at the potter at work, you would see the human potter, when he's working, he's into his work. He's designing, he's molding, he's shaping, and he's so involved that everything else takes a back seat. And, and you, you paint a pretty vivid picture there because I do have in my mind a potter with the clay sitting on the wheel spinning and he's got both hands in the clay uh, literally shaping it, uh, perhaps even inside, uh, you know, forming it into a bowl or to a cup of some sort. And that is true because once you're there observing the work of the potter, the clay looks pretty useless. It looks like there's nothing good coming out of it. But yet still, the potter is using a lot of skill and precision in cutting and shaping. And okay. at the end of that, we get a much more unique and precise vessel, something that when you looked at that initial clay or the comer, you didn't think that there was any hope for it. It looked like you could just throw it out. So when Jeremiah comes down here in verse Two, we are told, he goes down and he observes. It's a learning process. And I like to apply that to life. Because you see, there's a lot of what we call folks out there that need some type of help. Okay. And don't we all? And after 20 years of research in the field of substance abuse, they have found that America's spending approximately $140 billion a year. Oh, my word on trying to rehabilitate folks that are having problems with substances. Okay. And you know what they found to be working after 20 years of research? Tell me. Programs that are based on the concept of God, like Alcohol Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. So we see when we bring God into the equation, we don't have to spend $140 billion. All we need to do is observe what happens when God gets into the equation. And this is what Jeremiah was told to do. He went down to the potter's house. But notice, in verse 3, he was looking at the work being done on wheels. And I know you mentioned about the wheels spinning. Right. You know. That's the picture I have in my mind of what a potter is doing. And that's very significant because one of the things that we see is that early in the cultures of, like, let's say, the Sumer Sumerian cultures. Okay. When the work was being done, they molded and, and, and shaped the pottery, but there were no wheels. About 3,000 years after they came up with the wheels, and we're told by those who study the science of the pottery that around 2,500 BC in Egypt, they applied the foot pedal, so they started using both foot and hand. Interesting. So you okay. can now shape this clay into something much more constructive but also produce more mm -hmm. of a finished product. So Jeremiah is seeing God at work, and the work is being done in wheels. So it shows that God is already advanced. He knows we need to change lives and change it on a very high and productive scale. So I think it's important, though, for us to understand that uh, we stop reading at verse 4. When we get into verse 5 and 6, we really start to get into the heart of this message then of God being the potter. Uh, verse 5 says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, says the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. So we start to get this message of being molded, of being shaped uh, by God. And that's very, very interesting because one of the things you see that God is saying to his people, that I'm working with you for the process of change but you're not allowing me to do my work. Okay. It's almost like you're working with a resistive kind of a material as an engineer. And I'm sure you'll be able to share some thoughts in that area. What happens if a metal that you're trying to work with suddenly decides it's not going to cooperate? It tends, we call it a failure. It breaks, it might fall apart, it no longer does what it's been intended to do. Exactly. 
And if you go down even a little further into Jeremiah chapter 18, and verse 18, and it says, Then said they, Come and let us devise devices against Jeremiah, for the law shall not perish from the priests, nor counsels from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come and let us smite him with the tongue, and let us not give heed to any of his words. You see, the word that God uses to change our lives, their spirit and their life, and inherent to the word is the ability to change the material. But if the material is not malleable to change, you see, eventually it has to be thrown out. And so, like you said, in your area of work, when the material is not ready for the work that it's intended, it has to be discarded. And so you're, you're, I think, starting to draw the real powerful lesson here of us being molded by God, and that's where the hope comes in. We started our, our, our thinking with this idea of, of what the world around us does when there's hopelessness, when there's a feeling of hopelessness. But what we're seeing here then is that God is, is able to provide that hope if we will only allow ourselves to be molded by Him, to be conformed to His will. Excellent point. In fact, when we get to Jeremiah chapter 19, what we find happening is that God gets to a point where He looks at His work and He has to decide whether to discard it or not. Okay. Which is much more at a higher level than the human potter. Because when the human potter is at work, and he's shaping, and he's spinning, and he finish putting his work together, he has to pass that vessel through an oven. Some call it a kiln. Right. Has and to be fired. Yes. Has to be heated up, tremendously hot temperatures. And it has to be done at a very, very hot temperature, like you say. But what happens once that vessel passes through the fire? Well, it takes on a shape, right? It's hardened into that shape. It, so it is now what it's going to be, either a vessel for good or a vessel that can't be used. And if that vessel can't be used, what choices does the potter now have? He usually chooses to discard it. Has no other choice. Because once the vessel passes through the fire, and if it's not shaped into that vessel that it was intended, he has to throw it into the rubbish bin. But when we get to chapter 19, we see at verse 1 that God's process is much more extended. The vessel is marred. The vessel is broken. The life of the human being he's working with, he still, like you mentioned before, still has the ability to instill hope far beyond the human potter, but it gets to that point. And we're told in verse 1 at Jeremiah 19, Thus said the Lord, Go and get a potter's earthen bottle, and take of the ancients of the people and the ancients of the priests, and go forth into the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is by the entry of the east gate, and proclaim here the words that I shall tell thee. And in verse 11, we see what, how the point is summed up. It says, And shall say unto them, Thus said the Lord of hosts, Even so will I break this people in this city, as one breaketh a potter's vessel that cannot be made whole again. And they shall bury them in Thopheth, and there shall be no place to bury them. So God gets to that point where he is able to estimate when the vessel can truly no longer function, which is beyond the human potter, where we ourselves begin to fail, where we start spending billions of dollars without any positive results or very minimal results. So part of our blessing then is that through the scriptures and through what we're looking at today with this living parable, we find that um, there is a message of hope even within that. That what we've read about is the end point. Is when God has said, "I no longer can, I no longer find you able to be molded to my will." Yes. So and you had uh, shared with me previously that Job was one of those characters that had gone through this fire, um, and I find it interesting back in Job chapter four that this uh, the symbol, this uh, analogy of using the potter and the clay, is brought to us again. That's correct. So let's look that up. Job chapter 4, let's look at verse uh, 17. And here we have um, one of Job's friends saying to him, Can mortal man be righteous before God? Can a man be pure before his maker? 
Even in his servants he puts no trust, and his angels he charges with error. How much more are those who dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before the moth? And that's true, you know. What they were saying in essence to Job was, you're getting beside yourself, Job. There must be something that you have done wrong, that your life is so messed up at this point. What Job did, he actually was able to turn this statement to a truism and to explain further his predicament. If you look forward into Job chapter 10, for example, at verse 9, Job not only explains to his friends that he acknowledges that God is the one who is in charge, but that God is able to bring him out of the situation he was into and take him to a higher level or a higher place. And we read this in verse 9 when it says, even if we were to enter earlier verse for connection, it says in verse 8, Thine hands have made me and fashioned me together round about, yet thou dost destroy me. Remember, I beseech thee, that thou hast made me as the clay, and wilt thou bring me into dust again? So we see Job acknowledging that it is God who is his maker, and that God is in charge of his ultimate destiny. It is Job who says in the end, even after this body is destroyed, even after the skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. So if we're going to take this concept, then we need to move it forward into one that we can apply in our lives, this, uh, this concept of God being the potter, of us being the clay. Um, and so what, what lesson are, are you looking for us to take from that? One of the things that I see as part of being able to apply the principles of the potter and the clay is in the issue of self-esteem. Okay. For when we go to books like Isaiah, we started reading of, you know, individuals who are having problems, whose lives are not right. They feel less than, than anything. They feel like they're nothing. Now, God shows us through his word that he's able to bring us up to a level of self-esteem that we can't even imagine. In Isaiah 29, we see clearly in verse 15 and 16, we begin to read the words there that is being shown through the prophet Isaiah. When it says, let's enter into the connection a little earlier. Verse 13, wherefore the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips, do honor me, but they have removed their heart far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the precepts of men. Verse 15, woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, who seen us, and who knoweth us? So what did we see here is that God is saying there are those who come to him, but only pay lip service. Okay. All right? They are not following him with the heart, the mind, and the soul. They practice deceit, or they outright fail to listen to his message. And as a result, they have they become depressed with life because their achievements after time seem not to matter to them. And in chapter 30... Let's, uh, be just before you leave that, let's, sure. let's not skip verse 16 there, which is really uh, highlights the lesson that we're trying to pull here mm -hmm. um, and brings us back to the analogy that we're looking at with the potter. Um, you ch it says, you turn things upside down, shall the potter be regarded as the clay? You know, asking the question in reverse. Yes. Uh, that the thing made should say of its maker, he did not make me. Or the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding. So it's really there's the message to us as the clay is let's not turn it around. Let's not turn it upside down. It's God who's in control. So when you talk about self-esteem, um, you know, we have lots of books and lots of ways that we are told today about uh, developing our self-esteem and really the self-esteem should come from giving ourselves to God yes. and recognizing that it's through his molding of us that we have some strength of character. Yes, and I'm glad you mentioned that because he, he provides us with the blueprint mm. where we can truly evaluate ourselves. So 
when we are living our lives in accordance with what he's told us to do and not just paying lip service, we know our self-esteem is in accordance with God's esteem. And that is the highest level of quality of life we can truly live. So when we get to chapter 30, he brings out another aspect of it in verse 40, where it says there, and he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel, that in broken pieces he shall not spear, so that there shall be not found the bursting of a sherd to take away fire from the earth or to take away water with all out of the pit. What God is saying is the life that neglects his principles eventually becomes like a well without water or with a fireplace. Imagine in the midst of winter with no fire. So it becomes a hopeless life a life that ends up in a dead-end street. So really, it, it kind of comes down to the question is, will we as mortal men and women be willing to accept God as the supreme maker? Will we be able to accept him as the potter? And that's exactly uh, where you, you're right. Because it's a matter of choice. If we had set our own standards in terms of how we're going to live our life, how we're going to rate our self-esteem, the man who is self-taught and self-willed. In us, we all have a little bit of that going on. Mm -hmm. If we go by these principles, when we're saying to the potter, I don't need you. I can live my life. I can plot my own course. And we could even sing, I did it my way. <laughs> I know you know that famous singer that yes. sang that song, right? So I'm sure when we get into like people like the Apostle Paul, he brings out, the emphasis on how we really should be doing what we're doing as human beings to be successful. Yeah, so you mentioned Paul and the, the words that he says to us in Romans 9 at verse 15, or I'm sorry, at verse 19, are really very appropriate for our discussion today. Um, verse 19 says, Who will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? And that's really what we're trying to do is to um, allow ourselves to accept God's will, not to resist his will. Um, but, but who are you, a man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me thus? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for beauty and another for menial use? It really becomes the essence of what this is about, what the discussion is about, is, a lot, is taking ourselves out of the picture and allowing God to uh, work through us and to mold us into a character that is pleasing to him. And that's exactly right. In fact, in the same uh, chapter, it talks about Pharaoh. Mm. And we see a man who was so proud, who was so arrogant. He was willing to lose his whole empire and say no to God. And so we see what it is that when, as human beings, we begin to have this kind of an attitude that says, God, I don't need you. I can do it by myself we end up losing everything that we've lived for, everything we've achieved. And Pharaoh is an example of what happens in this way. And as we go on then and looking at these verses in Romans 9, it's, I think it's important to just pause a second and realize that the message is to us, to each one of us personally, to you, Tyrone, to myself, to each of our listeners. Um, you know, particularly now look at verse 22, uh, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience the vessels of wrath made for destruction? Verse 23, in order to make known the riches of his glory for the vessel of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. And here's the personal thought of it. Verse 24, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. And so it becomes a very personal message if we're willing to accept it, if we're willing to f allow ourselves uh, to be molded by God, to have God as the potter reach out and, and uh, shape us into a vessel that, as he says here, uh, a vessel that was um, uh, for beauty. Yes. And I think your point is well taken. But God is selecting a people for his name. And he's doing it globally. Mm. Out of all the nations of the earth, from the Gentiles. And this people that he's selecting will be ultimately for his glory. And that's, that's uh, an important concept because then it becomes uh, not only a personal message to each of us, but it becomes a message then for those who have responded to gather themselves together. 
right? It's the uh, scripture uses the term the house of God. Yes. We call it the ecclesia, the church. It is the, it's the gathering of, of men and women who are of like-minded belief. Yes. And I'm sure you would like to extend that invitation to all into the world today. As we say, you know, the ecclesia of God, or as some would call it, the church, is where God is working. In fact, Timothy was given this lesson very early in life. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, we are told, verse 20 and 26, that in a great house, there are different types of vessels. There are a variety of vessels. There are some of gold, there are some of silver, there are some of wood, there are some to honor and some to dishonor. And so, when we get to the Ecclesia of God, we begin to see God's work in the lives of the believers, shaping these various types of vessels. And we too can become a part of this great plan knowing that God is the one who's willing to shape our lives. All we have to do is to go down to the potter's house. That's all. And that really is a, is a very, very powerful message because we've, we've started with a living parable, words in the scriptures about a potter, about God, and we've concluded and brought it to the point where it's personal, where there's an offer of hope for yourself, there's an offer of hope for me, there's an offer of hope for each one of, the, of our listeners that if we will just take the time to allow God to mold us to be working in our lives. And it doesn't cost $140 billion <laughs> either. It sure doesn't. Here we have the scriptures laid out for us, uh, available to each and every one that is willing to use it. And one of the things that I'm sure that we can take from here with this message as well as we think about what we're saying is that it's not that it's totally free either. It is priceless because you see, eventually, I'm sure in our follow-up topic, we'll be able to look into where the Son of God himself was shaped by his father as the ultimate example and would pay a price with his blood, his precious blood, that we can't spend money to obtain this change. It is through him right. that we begin to be shaped ourselves. Well, Tyrone, thank you very much. Um, friends, we would invite you to stay with us. We'll be back in just a minute. We have some material we'd like to make available to you on this important topic. So please stay with us and we'll be right back. For pamphlets and articles on this subject and other Bible subjects, go to www.thisisyourbible.com, click on the Library tab, and select from Basic Bible Teaching, Bible Study, Doctrine, Life, Prophecy, the Christadelphians. In addition to our library, thisisyourbible.com offers online Bible study courses and Bible answers to your questions. Select www.thisisyourbible.com to increase your understanding of God's Word and learn about His future kingdom on the earth. Friends, welcome back. We've been with Mr. Tyrone Smart today. Tyrone has talked with us about this really important subject of the potter. And in this subject, he's helped us understand that the Lord has provided us a message of hope. If we will take that message and apply it to ourselves, if we will make it personal, if we'll let God mold us as the potter does the clay so that we're not tossed aside. Um, Tyrone will be back with us to carry on with this subject and talk to us about the potter and the clay to carry this on in a bit more depth. So we invite you back to join us for that. And we'd also like to be sure that you keep in mind that God's message for us through the scriptures, this message that we've talked about today through the potter and through the potter uh, going down to his house is a message of hope. Hope for each of you, each of us in this world of hopelessness. <laughs>